Healthcare. Um, we'll start with the number of patients we're looking after in Hartford Healthcare. We have 201 patients across the entities right now. Uh, we have four patients in Bacchus Hospital. Charlotte Hungerford has 10 patients. Hartford Hospital has 92 patients. Midstead Medical Center has 12 patients. St. Vincent Medical Center has 57 patients. Hospital Center Connecticut has 23. And Wyndham Hospital has three patients. We're also caring for a large number of patients in Community Network, which is 234 patients. And Behavioral Health Network has three patients. Uh, we've seen a continuous decline in our um, number of patients in acute facilities, but still 201, still a large number. Um, uh, but we are very pleased to note that um, St. Vincent Medical Center and Hartford Hospital has a significant decline, which were um, obviously the hardest hit uh, hospital uh, at once upon a time. Um, there's a, a lot of buzz around the state, uh, the state reopening, and how we are, healthcare institutions are preparing themselves to make sure we provide the care um, to all individuals with uh, safety um, as a uh, one of the uh, important principle, um, it, it become it remains a paramount interest to us to make sure the patients are safe, our community is safe, our colleagues are safe. And we're doing a lot of things. We're doing multiple things to make sure that that actually happens. As you know, in our EDs, we have a separate triaging track for anybody who's suspected of positive um, COVID. We're testing everybody who comes to the hospital right now, who gets admitted to the hospital, to make sure that they are not. Uh, converting positive. We're not taking chances with our asymptomatic patients, especially who are getting admitted at the moment. Our staff members are screened every single day, um, at temperature and uh, screening. Um, our patients who've been scheduled for essential surgeries are screened as well. They're tested for PCR, irrespective of if they have symptoms or not. We have a safety checklist. We've rolled out across the heart for healthcare. Every single unit, clinical unit across the heart for healthcare, healthcare is going through a um, a, a mandated uh, process to make sure the infection control processes are up to the uh, notch. We are auditing as well to make sure that those uh, uh, processes remain in place as well. A safety checklist is uh, it's very comprehensive. It's not only looking to the clinical uh, uh, the cleaning protocols across the units, it also looks into the PPE protocols. The individuals are trained, they understand how to wear that appropriately in all areas which are resuming the process right now. We're also making sure that um, we, we monitor um, uh, any of the trend happening in the community. As, we, as you know, we are uh, um, quite engaged in the community service right now, and we are looking into reaching out to the underserved area, providing testing in uh, other areas as well. So our teams are working in multiple uh, levels at the moment. Um, we have begun supporting the state with support of the critical state employees, uh, especially we've become the resource um, for the first responders um, and Department of Correction and many other areas across the state. Uh, we are extending our servicing, uh, uh, testing capabilities in um, uh, one of the most, some of the most vulnerable areas uh, where the access to the testing could be challenging through our mobile units as well. Um, our essential surgeries um, have been, um, begin all across the state at the moment, uh, all, the, all the hospitals across the state. Uh, we are gradually ramping it up. We want to make sure that the patients are uh, safe. They provided all the education regarding the COVID, uh, what can happen, what are the, um, how we're protecting themselves, and how we're making sure that safety is uh, of importance. We're seeing a lot of positive uh, results. The, the patients are uh, reaching out to us with uh, a tremendous amount of positivity, so I'm very encouraged by that. We've also launched a new website, uh, which is heartforhealthcare.org forward slash health wellness. Uh, forward slash coronavirus, uh, forward slash do the right thing. And that's the most important thing, doing the right thing for the patients and community. Uh, in the website, you can find the patients and community members can find all the things we're doing to make sure our, um, our processes are safe. Um, one of the, uh, the, the heartbreaking uh, issues we've seen, some of the individuals delaying their care process. They're not showing up to the hospital and delaying the care, uh, delaying the um, the time to seek the, the help of a providers and, and unfortunately in some incidences we have seen leading into the unfortunate events and delaying care. We want to avoid that. Our hospitals have always been available throughout the COVID crisis to provide the urgent and emergent surge, uh, procedures and surgeries and uh, treatment options. We're going to continue to do so. With that, I'm going to introduce one of my colleagues, Kevin Faradi. He's a System Director, Emergency Management Services. Um, EMS network development for Heart for Healthcare. Kevin. Thank you, Dr. Kumar. Good morning. My name is Kevin Ferrati. I'm the director of EMS for Hartford Healthcare. 
I am so honored to be here this morning because this week is one of our most favorite weeks of the year as it celebrates EMS Week. EMS Week started in 1974 as a national recognition to celebrate the great work that our first responders do each and every day. And it gives us an opportunity to be a little more of a formal week to celebrate their great work and the achievements of what they do. Obviously this year brings a little more of a special meaning in light of the current pandemic and a lot of the work that we are doing behind the scenes to make sure that our EMS community, EMTs, paramedics, and all of our first responders and how they work and collaborate with all of our healthcare pr uh, providers in our, throughout our hospitals. Our EMS providers are such an essential piece to how we deliver care in our hospitals and throughout our healthcare system. This pandemic has helped uh, shift a lot of what we do in a traditional sense in the pre-hospital environment and has taken a lot of our EMTs and paramedics and put them in untraditional roles where we're utilizing our folks within our system, such as our Wyndham Hospital paramedic team and working within our emergency departments and ICUs, our Lifestar team as well. And then also bringing in new employees new EMTs, new paramedics, and ingraining them in our work that the emergency departments have to do now. So not only, as Dr. Kumar stated, to treat our COVID patients and those that are of interest or, or under a possibility of, but also making sure that we have a safe area for our non-COVID patients, those that truly need emergency care to come in and, and receive the right care at the right time for themselves. So one of the folks that we have brought in is a colleague of mine, and I want to introduce him. His name is Tom Latozik. Tom is a Charlotte Hungerford Hospital Emergency Department paramedic. Good morning. I'm Tom Latozik. I'm one of the Emergency Department paramedics at Charlotte Hungerford Hospital. And as uh, my colleague Kevin said, I just came into Charlotte Hungerford Hospital. This is a new role for us. It's a new program at Charlotte Hungerford Hospital, and we're working in the emergency department to now deliver care that we would normally deliver outside the hospital as paramedics in our traditional role, but moving our role into the hospital setting. So paramedics, our mindset, our perspective, our education is focused on resuscitation and stabilization, which we bring an extension of the emergency room normally out to the patient. So. It's a new setting for us and a new role to be able to deliver that same care alongside the remainder of the emergency department team. Uh, life for us pre-COVID-19 pandemic was we would approach patients with you know, minimal personal protective equipment, what we considered standard precautions and our standard precautions have changed. And we've, we've changed how vigilant we are in our screening of patients uh, during this time. And the, I think the key word for us as EMS providers, as paramedics and EMTs, uh, no matter what setting we're in is vigilance. Our settings are dynamic, our settings are changing, and we're taking on new roles uh, along with everybody else during this difficult time. But we have adapted to the role, we've integrated ourselves into the emergency department at Charlotte Hungerford Hospital, and we are there to serve our community and there to uh, add a different, a different aspect of care to a patient's stay in the emergency department. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Kumar. Thank you. We'll open for any questions at this time. Dr. Kumar, uh, do you think it's safe to assume that after Connecticut begins to reopen that either cases will begin to go up or at least won't go down as quickly as they have been or otherwise would be if uh, the reopening were delayed? Um, so I think there are two different um, metrics to look at and watch out. The number of active cases in Connecticut and number of hospitalization. I think there are two different metrics to look at. The third one is the mortality, which is an important one as well. Um, I, I think we're going to continue to see some uh, rise in the number of active cases, and uh, that is expected as the pandemic um, um, evolves or goes further. Uh, and th this is a cumulative number we're going to increase, seeing the rate of increase, um, I like to believe that it would be slower and lower. Uh, now, it depends a lot on the social distancing, the universal, the mask utilization, and how we, how as community members, we behave as we go forward. 
Uh, but I anticipate the discipline the Connecticut residents have shown so far, um, and I hope to continue, I hope to see that they're going to continue to show, uh, will, will position us with some sort of a, um, um, a slower increase in number of uh, patients um, in the community number. The hospitalization uh, is a second metric, um, which, is, um, um, which is quite dependent at this time on how our most vulnerable population um, is going to be exposed or protected at this time. I'm talking about the nursing home, assisted living, as you've seen, significant rise in that number. And some of the inner city population um, is, is the how are we going to be seeing uh, the evolution. I like to believe if we continue social distancing, universal mask, hand hygiene, all the precautions, uh, we will continue to um, show a decline um, in the number of hospitalization. That's the most likely scenario. And we might see a here and there blimp, blimp, but I'm not too concerned about that at this time. I think we're going to continue to see a slow decline. The third part is the mortality. Uh, the number of deaths is, um, um, you know, it could rise in Connecticut. We are still seeing, um, you know, uh, anywhere from 50 to 60 uh, mortalities happening every single day, and that could continue to uh, at this pace at this time. Um, and it is because of the most vulnerable population, the nursing homes and assisted living and other areas will continue to show evolution at this time. As, as um, our as society opens up, I think if we continue to follow social distancing, some discipline around the travel, uh, we're going to hopefully um, reach a place where we're going to be able to live um, with the COVID-19 in our community, uh, but with safely, um, uh, with, with some sort of an economy being open. Uh, I don't think it's going to be 100 person opening um, uh, for a near future, and I don't think we're going to see a uh, complete elimination of COVID-19 from our society for a long time till the immunity, uh, till, the, till the vaccine comes up or some good therapies uh, come a long way. From what you see in the numbers, does this seem like about the right time to begin that reopening process or would you have rather they waited a little longer? Yeah, you know, I think, uh, frankly, as you know, um, we've, um, the teams um, governor has assembled and other members were seeing it. They've put the best minds together. Uh, I, I think there's really no uh, playbook uh, which could tell you exactly how it needs to be done uh, based on what I've learned, what I've understood, what I've uh, um, observed through the different modeling. I think this is the right place to be at this time. Uh, we need to be cautious. We need to be um, optimistic. Um, but at the same time, we need to continue to uh, follow the safety principle. And I like to believe it's the right time at this time. Good morning. It's Bridget from the Republican American. Hello, Kevin, if you're still there. Kevin's uh, still here. Um, wondering about bringing the paramedics into the ER. What was the motivation Kevin. for that? Is it volume or screening or additional layers of care, what was behind that? Yeah, good morning, Bridget, and thank you for that. It, <clears throat> I think the, the pandemic has uh, created an environment where we need to think a little more outside the box, where, you know, as the number of exposures have increased, as our healthcare providers are, you know, are, are being affected both uh, physically in terms of the exposure risk, but then also the mental well-being we need to think a little bit differently as the, the traditional paradigm. So bringing the paramedics into the emergency department is to not only bring that uh, pre-hospital expertise, because a lot of these patients, as Dr. Kumar said, they're waiting too long to get to the emergency department. So by the time they get there, they need intense intervention that our paramedics uh, throughout the state, whether it's at Wyndham, at Charlotte, or with our Lifestar team throughout Hartford Hospital and St. Vincent's Medical Center in Bacchus, can take those patients and immediately assist in, in a lot different way because again these are these are very acutely ill patients and the way I like to see it is the more hands the better right the more hands that are that we're able to provide that same level of quality care that we did 12 weeks ago that we are now able to still do throughout our system not only is a, a, tr a, a true tribute to our paramedics but most importantly, our in-hospital clinicians and our system-wide leadership. And is that beyond Charlotte Hungerford? Is it the seven hospital network, or is it just Charlotte? Yeah, no, we we have we have uh, uh, deployed pre-hospital providers throughout our state. So we have had paramedics uh, at Wyndham Hospital for 25 years. 
Our Bacchus Hospital down in Norwich has a standalone emergency department. They've had paramedics in their emergency department for many, many years and uh, bringing Lifestar out as well to assist because again, they have that critical, they have that, that critical care training that uh, you know, is obviously put into great use in the pre-hospital sense, but now we're able to also add to it in the, uh, in the acute care setting. Okay, thank you. And that's new for Charlotte, right? It is new for Charlotte, yep. Okay, thanks, Kevin. You're welcome. Uh, there are a couple of questions coming on the Facebook. One is about the remdesivir. We are using it. We have, um, uh, this is almost the second week going into the remdesivir use um, across the heart for healthcare. Uh, we have a reasonably, a reasonably good supply, um, thanks to a state's effort and FEMA's distribution model. We received another batch on Friday uh, of more than 600 vials, 689 to be precise. So uh, we continue to use that. On the other front, convalescent plasma, we've transfused to about 300 patients so far. So that's also been used uh, quite um, widely. Um, and um, uh, I think these are the two other comments which came along. The other ones regarding the, um, there's another question regarding the New York. Are we expected to see some rise in Connecticut? As I answered earlier on, you know, we were gonna see the community numbers going to rise. Uh, it's difficult to predict, uh, depending on the social distancing, what the peaks and valleys are gonna look like. But we're going to see some fluctuation. As I had mentioned earlier on, the, what we had hoped for, a rapid decline in our number of cases, is not going to happen. We're going to have a slow decline, and this disease is going to persist in our community for a long time. Uh, a follow-up <clears throat> question to remdesivir. Is it effective? Is it effective? Uh, remdesivir, as you know, is a, is a recently studied medication. Uh, what we have known is that it reduces the um, critical care stay at the ICU a length of stays reduced significantly in these boy patients. Uh, we, we are still waiting for um, 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 research data to evaluate the mortality uh, data. Um, there is some apparent benefit, but it's not been proven yet. So uh, time will tell. Uh, it's promising, um, but we don't, I, I can't comment because the research is not um, complete yet. Another couple of questions just coming in. What are you doing to support patients with emotional disabilities who are not allowed to have people accompany them to the hospital? Um, we continue to evaluate our visitor policy and obviously we accommodate for individuals who require support. We have additional measures in place such as uh, we have iPads and technologies being present. We are obviously constant in daily touch with the family members. So we've done a lot of different things to make sure that those members are accommodated appropriately. Um, why are some doctor's offices not opening, especially primary care doctors? The Heart for Healthcare primary care doctors are all opening, um, and they should be able to um, um, see the patients at uh, any time. We started last week on that part here. Um, regarding the other non Heart for Healthcare primary care doctors who are not opening, I really can't comment. Uh, we have pr provided um, uh, different tools uh, for our, our primary care, the screening protocols, the PPE, adequate educational material, the hand sanitizers, uh, and obviously we want to make sure that our, all the primary care health care uh, systems, uh, all the primary care clinics have telehealth capacity, virtual health capacity, uh, and obviously they are able to, they're fully staffed um, at this time, so we are open. Can we still go to the emergency room with other issues? Of course, um, emergency rooms are designed for that. Uh, and in fact, uh, uh, what, if what uh, this pandemic has taught us in the last seven, um, in, in two or three months is that we become really good in making sure that the safely, we take care of the patients who are uh, COVID positive in a, in a, s a slightly different track and the COVID uh, negative or apparently no COVID issue in a different track. And I think this is working out very well. We are seeing increased number of patients coming to our emergency rooms gradually uh, who are non-COVID related illnesses. And that's what the ED's primary role is to be able to provide the care to all, not just the few. Follow up to um, also again the remdesivir question, can any ill patient with COVID get that treatment? Uh, the the criteria are um, um, generally um, based on some, uh, some, some specific metrics. Uh, we, what we describe is in a, in a, in a uh, layman's terms, impending ventilation. Somebody who might require a ventilator, uh, that means oxygen saturation is declining, they are uh, looking into the, the deteriorating, uh, we start those patients on remdesivir. We try to aim for earlier indication, earlier use rather than late. That means 
even before the patient gets in the ventilator, we start. Uh, obviously, the medication came recently, and we've given it to the patients who are in ventilator as well. Um, so yeah, generally, um, almost all patients um, who um, require remdesivir will get the remdesivir. Um, a question from uh, Pat yeah. from the Associated Press. Um, can you talk about the testing in prisons? How is that proceeding? Did the results that led to the lockdown at Osborne surprise you? You know, our, we, have, we have a very strong partnership with the state to provide those services to all the Department of Corrections and um, other uh, facilities such as uh, uh, um, churches and other areas where the, there is a there could be a uh, access issues for the patients to to get the testing done. Um, the results um, are, um, are, to, are to be managed by the state. I like the state to comment on that. Um, you know, it's it's of concern when we see a large cluster of patients uh, being uh, individuals being positive in any part of the community. I, I really don't know whether I can comment whether it surprised me or not at this time because I think the state will have to assess and advise on that part. We're partnering here providing a support. Um, same criteria for plasma, same criteria as remdesivir. Yeah, the plasma is, uh, is uh, we've used obviously for a little bit more time now. We have some understanding. We are again giving to those patients actually who are um, um, impending ventilation or on ventilation. Uh, we've used it a bit more liberally because we've had it for a long time and uh, it has been proven to be very safe uh, medication to give at this time. Um, we like to believe, at least the earlier indications, there is a benefit as well. However, again, as always, the, you need a larger randomized trials to be able to comment on the true efficacy of this medication. So we are still waiting for the results. As you know, this COVID has challenged us significantly in different ways. Uh, we continue to see the challenges in all sorts of patient population. We're learning as we go along uh, in most of the medication use. But Heart for Healthcare's commitment has to be, is always been like, using the safe medication and the safe approach. And that's what we're doing at this time. Um, another question, how are positive case, cases in Mid-State today? Mid-State has 12 patients who are positive. Um, that's, that's where we are right now. And numbers are declining, obviously. And Mid-State um, has, uh, because of the uh, you know, Heart for Health Care's facility, especially Mid-State has large capacity. They're able to segregate those individual patients in a location so the non-COVID work uh, can um, go in parallel without um, any disruptions. And that's going very well. Very good. Any other comments or questions from anybody on the phone? Well, if not, then thank you very much.